Uh, we are in Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1. And as you are turning there, um, I don't know, with all the news clips um, this time of year, have you seen some commemoratives come up for D-Day? Um, and as you've seen that maybe come up on your feed or a news or seen various things of that, have you seen the commemoratives uh, and memorials of D-Day? And sometimes you'll see those silhouettes of all the soldiers in the background. And uh, just a second, am I a little loud right now? No, no I'm okay, good. Um, with, with that, the Allies, thank you so much, Josh. The Allies, as you know, they fought to uh, invade France, to free Europe, if you would, from the Third Reich and the power of the Nazis of the time. And if you could just imagine it playing the old 1940s song that most of you don't know, but there was a song that was the top of the charts back then, and it was called The White Cliffs, Cliffs of Dover. In this old song, the British were singing of the day when one day the bluebirds would sing again. When one day over the White Cliffs of Dover, they would be home and Jimmy would sleep in his room again. You're like, what does that mean? Well, when you've got sandbags on your roof to protect you from bombing, and you're putting your kids, and not, not just that, you're sending your kids. One of my neighbors was an orphan from London because so many were killed. And you're, you sent your children out to the countryside. You didn't even have your kids during World War II because of the amount of bombing going on in the city of London. Well, think of that scenario and that backdrop. Meanwhile, Monument after monument has lists of names on it. Have you been to a war memorial before? I encourage you to go. It's, it's a sobering moment where we honor those who've gone before us, and we also just take a moment to think, you know what, freedom is not free. It costs a lot. You know, I've gone, and sometimes you take a piece of paper, and you, you, uh, you put a pencil and paper, and you kind of get the outline, the etch of family members that have died and they're on this monument or that monument. And I've done that before for some family members. And those monument lists, do those names mean anything? You're like, oh yeah, they mean a lot. It costs a lot. And you know, today as we're going to come to you, come to the book of Numbers, chapter 1, we're going to see some numbers going on. And as we look at the monuments of D-Day, we say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We owe our freedom to you. And it, we not only that, and we love you. When you see in the Bible names given, God is saying, I'm honoring you, I love you, I'm organizing you as a people. This is, they're not just any old names. If your name was in the Bible, you're like, well, this would be pretty, pretty cool. But sometimes we see lists of names that are like, I, I don't have an association with that. And God's like, I'm loving this person, I'm organizing. And I want you to turn to the fourth book of the Bible, the book of Numbers today. As we have completed our uh, Exodus survey, we are now in Numbers, and we're going to uh, walk through the first couple chapters. I'm not going to read all of the list, but I will have us um, going through uh, much of this. And as uh, we go through this period of uh, Scripture, I want you to... Look at the first four verses. Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai <coughs> in the tabernacle of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt saying, take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel by their families, by their father's houses, according to the number by their of names of every male individually from 20 years old and above all who are able to go to war in Israel you and Aaron shall number them by their armies and with you there shall be a man from every tribe each one the head of his father's house we see that we're going to see through this book two censuses taking basically there will be two consecutive generations in this book of numbers as you know, the book of Exodus kind of spans about 81 years, the life of Moses. Then you get in the book of Leviticus where it's only a, a month, basically, of giving ceremonial laws. <clears throat> and then the book of Numbers, we've started out, and what should only be 
a 11 day journey through the wilderness from Egypt over to the promised land, eh, it kind of stalls. And, and there, if they had a song back then that fit them, it would probably be on the road again. Because for 38 years, actually 40 years in all, all they did was walk around and around and, and just set up camp and move in the wilderness until the first generation died off. Like, why? What's that about? Unfortunately, the first 25 chapters are going to be the disorganization of unbelief. If you don't believe God, it leads to all kinds of wandering. And that's what's going to happen here. If you don't hang upon the word of God, in fact, as you're going to see in this first part of our, our passage, we're going to see, now the Lord spoke to Moses 150 times. It's going to come. And there's 20 other variants that are going to come up with something like that where God is saying the Lord spoke. When you and I look at the Bible, we're like, God spoke this. This has got authority behind it. This has got punch behind it. God said this. The problem was, what did the children of Israel do when they came right up against the promised land? They come up there and they're like, I don't know. Can we take this place? Man, there's giants in the land. There's no way we could do that. Who are they believing? Their fears. The impossibilities of life. They weren't going up based on the 150, thus says the Lord, God spoke to Moses statements. Instead, they were saying, I don't know about this. I don't think I'm strong enough. Friend, for us to walk by faith, you've got to love God's word. And you can't live with your finger in the air about whether you're able to do. In your weakness, his strength is made strong. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is able to use you in your frailty so that he might be glorified? And that's one of the lessons that we need to learn as we come through this. Really, God wants us to be able to follow orders. I want you to look at the, a few key verses of the book. A key verse is a verse that kind of summarizes a lot of the, the main thing, if you would, the big idea of what's going on in the book. Turn over to chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 27 to 30. In verse 27, let's, let's actually pick up 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. And all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jehunaphil, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you to dwell. But, it, but your little ones, whom you said would be victims, I will bring in and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity, and until your carcasses have consumed, um, are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days which you have spied out the land, forty days of each day you shall bear your guilt one year namely 40 years and you shall be you shall know my rejection here in this passage you see that god's like hey you have you've forsaken me because you didn't believe me you chased iniquity you went after the wrong things and god's like for that i am i'm not going to let you into the land and so that is uh, where we find ourselves today. In the first 25 chapters, it will be the first generation. And in that first generation, 
their unbelief, rebellion, and despair, and death will mark their march. Why? Because they complain against the Lord. At complaining, isn't that okay? Like, I'm not gambling my money away. I'm not getting drunk. I, isn't complaining okay? God's like, no, this, this is not okay. Do you know what complaining a lot of times is? It's us saying, God, I can't believe you're good enough in this moment of life. What is that? That's anti, it's antagonistic against faith. If we're going to live by faith, Christian, we're going to need to live rejoicing and thanking God instead of complaining. Meanwhile, the children of Israel are coming into the land and they're like, there's no way. Our little kids are all going to, they're all going to be gobbled up by these bad guys. They're so much bigger than us. There's no way we can make it. And God's like, hold it. You, get, you aren't getting this. Your little ones are going to conquer the land. Isn't that the irony of God? God's like, because you don't have faith, I'll let your kids win the battle. But you are not going to get to taste this promise because you would not believe me. So we have this huge challenge. We also see that um, the next generation begins and ends with Zelophad's daughters. I'm like, I've never heard of Zelophad. Well, you're going to hear about Zelophad in a few months. But in chapter uh, 27 to 36, it begins in chapter 27 and ends in chapter 36 with uh, the kind of dale, tubdale, um, dovetail, the, that, that section of the second generation because their daughters believe firmly in the promise of God. They acted on faith and they're great examples of what God wants modeled for us. Well, with that uh, being uh, what it is, I want you to look at our first, our challenge, if you would, a well-ordered life. God expects you to listen to his authority to order your life around himself. Do you want an ordered life? It needs to be ordered around God. You cannot manage life if it's not ordered around God. If he's not first, then everything else will crowd what really matters for eternity. When we go through suffering and difficulty, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and greater weight of glory. Isn't that what 2 Corinthians 4.17 says? What does that mean? Do we believe that this epoch of time that we're living in is brief? I better live for Jesus with all I got. Do you know what I mean? Because eternity matters. Now, you can't work your way into heaven. But you can live by faith, post-salvation, and it counts for eternity. And today, as uh, we look <clears throat> through this passage, I want us to consider our first point. Order yourself around God's authority. <clears throat> around God's authority. We saw this in verses 1 through 4. And God spoke to Moses. This powerful statement, 150 times, plus 20 other time ways that the Hebrew name for this book comes up and Yahweh spoke, the Lord spoke. Here the emphasis is God is authoritative and we should be listening. You know what also it tells us? You know, Justin celebrated the grace of God. What does this tell me? God takes the initiative to talk to us. Isn't that cool? Like, I don't know God talked to me. We got this Bible, do you not? This is what God has said. And God has spoken to us through his word and he wants us to take it in. And the fact that God has taken initiation, did humanity deserve this? No. Do you deserve this? Do you deserve to go to heaven? Not at all. This relationship and his, his will for your life is an evidence that God is kind to us. That he would even, I mean, why does he waste time on sinners? Hey, we have all got bad attitudes. How much do you complain? I mean, we've all complained. Doesn't complaining kind of grate on you when those around you just like, rah, 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 rah. and what does God do with a bunch of complainers? He's like, I'm, I'm going to let you know what you can do to do what's right and have a relationship with me. God wants us to know him by faith. And that faith says, you know what? God, is, he is so gracious. He wants me to know him. Well, in chapter 1, we see that in verse 2, uh, verse 1 and 2, 
You see, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness while he was in the tabernacle, and uh, he gives instructions here. God has spoken. It, it implies that you and I need to be listening. Are we hearing what God says? Now, the, the book of Numbers, it, it comes from the, the Greek Septuagint, basically, um, and the number in Latin follows it, the, the name Numbers. But the Hebrew name of most Old Testament books is the first few words in Hebrew that you have. So, and God spoke is one Hebrew title for the book. Another one is in the desert. Uh, the word wanderings is going to come up like close to 50 times, if I remember right. It, so this book is just full of the wanderings of wayward Israel. Why are they wandering? Because they would not grasp God by faith. You know, Numbers is a period of 38 years and 9 or 10 months is what it's going to be uh, covering. Meanwhile, Israel is going to bracket everything around the Exodus. And that's really kind of the time element, verse 2, that you have. It's kind of like we say A.D. and B.C., before Christ, after the dominion of Christ. And so we, we kind of base everything off of Jesus. Well, they base everything off of the Exodus, verse 2, and that's why your time signature is based on the great deliverance of the Exodus. Well, we see that verse 2, God's like, I want you to take a census. Uh, I want you to take a number of all the people. Oh, why does he need to take a number? Wasn't David forbidden to take a census? Do you remember David getting in trouble for that? Why was David in trouble, but God commands it here? That's a good question. And I believe the answer has to do with David was warned by Joab, don't do this lest you basically sin against God by trusting in your own strength. Why is God doing this? Where has Israel come? They were a bunch of slaves. They've just left Egypt. What were the, what is their, if you were to ask, okay, what were you, what was your job? What was your job? Oh, I was shepherd. What were you? Bricklayer, 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 bricklayer. Uh, how much military experience do you have? Oh no, we've never even had a weapon. The only weapons we ever saw were the ones we were beat with. Um, they, they're slaves. The book of Numbers is basically a census taken so God would organize the nation for a military purpose because you need to be ready to go into the land. The book of Joshua, General Joshua is going to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. And as he's preparing for that, if you would, the purpose of the census is a military roster. This is not political. It's not a power move. It's simply organizing the people of God. Another good lesson for us is our God is a God of order. Do you want to be a little more sane in your life? You should be ordered too. That's why a schedule is good. Routine is good. Job lists are good. Why do we do those things? Because God is a God of order. Why do we, as a church, we're told, do all things decently and in order? Why did God have to say that? Because the church at Corinth, there were people that were speaking in tongues and taking over the message, and, and they were just, it was all about them. It was a them show. Church should not be a them show. It should be us orderly worshiping the Lord. It's not about individual personalities. It's about God being worshiped by us individually and corporately together. So we know the order is a biblical concept of which you and I want to continue to grow in. We see that all the clans and families, literally the word families is the word bait, uh, house of fathers. So we see that God is bringing all the, the families together according to their fathers. And uh, this is so that they can organize an army and be ready for the conquest. Well, as this is unfolding, we see that in verse 4, one other little detail is that and with you there shall be man from every tribe, each one the head of his father's house. So God is going to very clearly through this book emphasize the tribes. Why is that important? Why couldn't the Israelites sell their property to someone and get rid of it? Why couldn't you, why couldn't one of the tribes just disappear? Because God's like, I made my promise to each one of the tribes of Israel. 
and you're gonna make it to the end basically. I'm gonna make it so that you are taken care of. God takes care of his people and he wants them, if you would, to not disappear. So even when they almost annihilated one of the tribes, they're like, we better give up some of our um, young men to marry their daughters so that that whole tribe doesn't disappear. Why is that important? This guy, this is God's, this is God's people. We need to make sure we provide for them. So that's a little bit of the what's going on back then. Well, turn over to chapter 36, verse 13 for just a moment. So the very end of the book, chapter 36 and verse 13. These are the commandments and the judgments which the Lord commanded the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plains of Moab, by the Jordan, across the Jericho. Commanded. God gave this so that they would, hey, this is your instructions. You know, parents, when are children getting in the most trouble? when they have no boundaries, when there's no supervision, and they have no rules. Why is that? Because we didn't give them instructions. So they found trouble to get into. In our parenting, we know that we need to be ordered. In life, we know we need to be ordered. We need to give instruction and direction. God says, hey, you don't want to wander for all of your life. You need instruction. You need God's commandments. You need God's order. And so, again, we see the authority of God in this. Well, our next, our sub-point A, we need to shape your identity around God's authority. Shape your identity around God's authority. Now, verse, um, let's look at these names. A few of the, let's jump into verse 5. These are the names of the men who shall stand with you from Reuben, Eleazar, the son of Shedur, and from Simeon and Shemuel, the son of Jerashadai. And we go all the way down through the list, basically through verse 16. And you see these, this list of people. Verse 16, these are the chosen from the congregation, leaders of their father's tribes, heads of the divisions in Israel. Now, if you were to go through there, you would see in this list, you see the name El and a lot of the names. And you see Shaddai come up. What is El in Hebrew? It's God. It's the Hebrew name for God. What is Shaddai? Almighty. And so if I were to give you an interpretation, Elijah, my God is rock. In fact, I included um, a, uh, a handout on this in your... Um, you've got Shemuel, my God is peace. Nathaniel, God has given. Eliab, God, my father. Elishama, my God has heard. Gamuel, God is goodness, my goodness, my reward. Pegiel, God is my entreaty. Elisha, my God has added a child. Duel, they sought or seek God. Jur Shaddai, Shaddai is my rock, or the Almighty is my rock. Am Shaddai, Almighty, the Almighty is my kinsman. Shadur is a revocalization of Shadrai, which is Shaddai, or the Almighty is a flame. So you, you got these cool names. If you want names for your kids, you know, these are so, just some really cool names that my God is Almighty, my God's a flame. Could you imagine? What's your name, son? My God is the torch. You know, he's just lighting things. I mean, that's pretty cool if you're a boy. And it, but it's more than that. It's like their faith is fixated on the almighty God. If you've just gone through the Exodus, wouldn't you be saying, man, my God is strong. Man, my God is the almighty. He's powerful. And that is what we're seeing giving here. My God is peace. My uh, Eliab, my God is a father, the son of Helion. His name is Rampart-like. These are war names, but they're like, my God is stronger than anything I've ever seen. 
He, he just took out Egypt, guys, the superpower of the ancient world. Nobody's like Egypt. He's drowned the horse and the rider, the chariot. He's taken off their wheels. No one is. My God's a rampart. My God is a rock. My God has ransomed me. My God is Shaddai the Almighty. And we see that in verse 16, there's an important phrase. These were chosen. These men, they're appointed by God. It's a technical term for representatives. Uh, the Expositor's Bible Dictionary shares. Verse 16 is a legal former, formal and precise in tone. The phrases are used to give sanction to each of these leaders. God has selected them. They've been placed there. And we see that God's hand is in this. You and I need to be shaping our identity around God's authority. And they chose all the names of their kids and their family around their God. We're like, because my identity is going to be wrapped around him. Do you wear the name Christian with joy? A, a Christ follower? Are you one that says, you know what? I am, I am honored to be called a Christian. I want to be known as a believer. I want to be known as the one that shares the hope of Jesus with a lost and dying world. Here, their identity is so wrapped around God. They, are, they have just dwelt on him and like, man, this is who I want to be. I want my children to be known as. B, preparing yourself for God's service. Look over in verse 17 and 18, would you please? 17 and 18. Then Moses and Aaron took these men who had been mentioned by name. And they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month. And they recited their ancestry by families, by their fathers' houses, according to the numbers of names, from 20 years old and above, each one individually. As the Lord commanded Moses, so he numbered them in the wilderness of Sinai. Now the children of Reuben, actually we're going to stop there. So verses 17 through 19 we see that God has numbered the tribes. Why? Because they're mustering up an army and they have special functions. Now, one of the special names that God showed of himself was that he was going to be their warrior. He was going to fight for them, Exodus 15.3. Yes, I mean Exodus 15.3. And we go here in Numbers 1.18 that they need to be 20 years or more. So basically... All those under 20 were not held responsible to fight. So all those who are 20 and older, they're ready to fight. And they come up against the land, as we're going to find out later, and they chicken out. And they're like, we're not going to believe God for this because we allow our fears to be bigger than our God. Uh, which is an incorrect view, obviously, of reality. With this, we need to be prepared for service to God here they're like let's take the number let's get everybody involved that supposed, is supposed to be involved and that's where we find them see remembering God is in the numbers God is in the numbers so from verse 20 all the way to 46 we have this large portion of scripture and the children of Reuben Israel's oldest son verse 20 their genealogies by their families their father's house, according to the number of the names, every male individually from 20 years old and above, all who were able to go to war. Those who were numbered of the tribe of Reuben were 46,500. So we come into this and you're going to see that there's four characteristics with each one of the 12 brackets that you go through here. We're not going to read this whole section, but basically... One, you have the name of the tribe, the specifics of those who are numbered, the name of the tribe restated, and fourth thing you see is the total enumerated for that tribe. So as you go through, you're going to see Ephraim, 40,500, Manasseh, 32,200, Benjamin, 35,400. You have a tally going for each one, if you would. Now, you're like, Pastor, I'm not an accountant. Now, I'm looking at one accountant in the church, but I mean, there's, with accounting, you're like, this is a lot of numbers. But remember, this is God saying, you matter to me, and 
you're organized for war and I'm, I'm setting you up for success. The numbers matter. And so with that, you know what this also tells me? There's no spectators. Christian, do you know why the church is dying in America today? Because we've gotten lazy and we, we, the church in America is becoming a spectator sport. I come hear the sermon. If I don't get what I want, if I don't feel filled, then the church isn't good. What are you giving? The problem with the church in America is it's a bunch of leeches who've come to church and because their only function is blood sucking, they don't do anything. Now, I'm not calling you blood suckers, okay? That's a, it's an ugly picture there. But if it's a spectator sport, the church can't function that way. And the reason the church is dying, when you see these huge mega churches like the Willow Creek out in Chicago, that was the biggest church in America, and you had theater seating and coffee um, and everything else. I mean, they had just this huge, everything was about you. It was the seeker-sensitive mo movement. What happened with the seeker-sensitive movement? It eventually died. Why? It's just like we, what they tried in the 60s. Did you know that there was a drive-in movie theater church? You drive in, you park, you listen, you tune into the radio. It comes in through your radio and you get to watch TV on the big screen. What happened to that church? Died. You know why it died? They weren't involved. If the people of God are not doing the work of God, it's not going to work. If you don't have ownership, it doesn't work. Here, God is saying to Israel, for you to be a nation, you're going to conquer this land. I'm not going to hand this to you completely on a silver platter. You're going to arm yourself, everyone 20 years and older. This is not a spectator sport. You are going to fight this battle, but I'm going to give the victory. I'm going to be your warrior, Exodus 15.3. I am going to go with you into battle, but you must be ready, numbered, armed, organized, and going. So Christian, make sure that too, even in our age, the church age, that we are not living a spectator men mentality. All men of age on deck, God is preparing them to, for the conquest. Now, we do see one exception. Look over in verse uh, 47. We see that the tribe of Levi is not listed. But of the Levites were not numbered among them for their father's tribe. For the Lord had spoken to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi shall you not number nor take a census of them among the children of Israel but you shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony over all, all its furnishings over all the things that belong to it they shall carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings they shall attend to it and camp around the tabernacle and when the <coughs> tabernacle is going forward the Levites shall take it down and when the tabernacle is to be set up the Levites shall set it up and the outsider who comes near shall be put to death and the child children of Israel shall pitch their tents everyone by his own camp everyone by his own standard according to their armies but the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of testimony and there there may be no wrath on the congregation of the children of Israel. And the, is the Levites shall keep charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. So we see them performing all these things. And God, is, I think we can take away from this, dedicating yourself to God's purposes. We want to make sure that we're dedicated to it. In fact, what does Israel do? Verse 54, thus the children of Israel did according to all the Lord commanded to Moses. So they did. So they follow God's instructions. They come into this and uh, they're like, hey, whatever God says, that's what we're going to do. Now, they come into this ready to serve and the Levites, they're not part of the military might. They're just going, in fact, they're part of the grace of God. You and I could look and like, man, God's hard. If someone touches or comes near the tabernacle, they come 
it past the boundary, they're, they're going to die? I, did you notice that I gave a folded picture in your bulletin? You're going to see the placement of the tribes of Israel. You've got the north side, south, east, and west. And you have three tribes. They're all in a triad. And basically, if I could summarize this, each tribe had their own standard, their own flag going in. And then there was a lead, if you would, triad. Each one, north, south, west, east, um, all four directions had their own standard, their own flag. Have you ever seen like revolution, or not rev, uh, say like the battle at Gettysburg or some of the reenactments or anything? You always see all these flags of, you know, the cavalry over here and these troops and what numbers they are. And here you see the organization of flag. If you were near Israel, you would know exactly where your tribe was. Why? Because you'd see, oh, the line of the tribe of Judah. This is Judah. You look on the standard. Oh, that's Ephraim. You could look all around and you're like, I know exactly. I'm north, south, east, west. You didn't, if you were directionally impaired, all you had to do was read. Okay? You could recognize your, your flag. Maybe it's color or insignia on it. Whatever it happened to be, it was very well organized. But there's another grace here. Who was stationed all the way around the tabernacle? The children of the Levites. The entire tribe is around. And you have the Koath, the sons of uh, Korah, the Koath. And you've got uh, the different heads of families on all four sides. Why? Because that was the grace of God to keep you from stumbling into the camp where you didn't belong. Well, why does that matter, God? Because God's like... I can't just be flippantly approached. The Old Testament pictures the fact that every person is born separated from God and you can't just walk into God's presence. The church age, we can because Jesus' blood covered our sins. Not just covered, it removed, expiated, totally removed. And he was a wrath removing sacrifice on my behalf. So I might boldly enter into his presence. Is that what Hebrews says? That was not true in this day. God's like, you all are lost. Not only are you going to go to hell if you don't know me, but if you stumble into my presence thinking that it's okay to come to God on your terms, it's gone, dead, over with. God is not a joke. And our world wants to say, man, God's got to be more politically correct for him to be okay for me. Eh, so why does God have to obey your rules? Hello, Where are you? what are you thinking? It's like defying gravity and saying, oh, no, I rewrote the rules of gravity. They, it's not going to, when I fall out of this airplane, it's not going to be a problem, okay? All right, the bungee cord's too short. It doesn't matter. I rewrote it. I'm, I'm confident because I feel good about this bungee cord, it's all okay. Any problems with that logic? If it's not based on truth, it's no good. God is truth. He writes the rules. So, those are the obvious things there. But let's go on here, and we see that our chapter 2, order yourself around God's authority by being centering your life around God. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Every one of the children of Israel shall camp by his own standard, beside the emblems of his father's house. They shall camp some of, at some at a distance, sorry, they shall camp some distance from the tabernacle of meeting, on the east side towards the rising of the sun, those of the standard of the forces with Judah shall camp according to their armies. And <coughs> Nahashan, the son of Abinadab, shall be the leader of the children of Judah. And his army was numbered at 74,600. So here we see, center your life around God, his plans. In the next 30 verses, from verse 3 to 33, we see follow God's arrangements and you see each one of the tribes listed off in position where they were to be. And again, all of Israel is centered around God. God's in the middle and I'm going to live my life around him. With that, true compliance is worship. So let's see a few things. One, look in verse 17. 
And the tabernacle of meeting shall move out with the camp of the Levites in the middle of the camp, camps. As they camp, so shall they move out, everyone in his place, by their standards. Just picture this. So be in formation. That's what God says. Fall in line, stay in formation. This is how we're going to operate. So all the tribes move together according to marching orders, according to placement. Again, God is a God of order. This is no mistake, if you would. And uh, we want to be ones that say, Lord, this, this is how you've made things. Now, one thing I didn't touch on was the fact that we see these, I don't understand, but so many liberals have really a big problem, theological liberals. They say, there couldn't have been 600 and some thousand people that were men. That's just too big. Can we think through this biblically? Do you remember back in Exodus chapter 1? The, what did it say? That God blessed the children and they multiplied greatly. Do you remember that language in chapter 1 of Exodus? Not only did God multiply them, and, and remember the Hebrew midwives, they're like, there's babies every way, everywhere, and uh, they, were, they truly were multiplying. Do you remember what God promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, 15, Genesis um, 17 and 22? I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to make you as the sand of the sea. Do we believe God kept his promise? The problem the liberals have with believing the, problem, the Bible is they deny the supernatural. They don't believe that God actually blesses, that the children of Israel really grew with these rapid numbers. But yet everything consistently, if an argument is a farce, there would be evidence within the Bible that would dismiss it. And what do we see throughout the whole of the Bible? God said, I'm going to bless you. The beginning of Exodus, some 80-some years earlier, said that God had rapidly blessed them. The five Hebrew phrases, stunning growth of the Hebrews. Um, in fact, and later in chapter 1 of Exodus, what did Pharaoh say? Their numbers are getting too big. What if they rise up against us and take us over? Why would Pharaoh be afraid of that as a superpower of the world? Because if you have 600,000 men, you're talking a population of some two to three million. Conservatively and easily, you could say there are two and a half million people. That's a great size people. Why would Pharaoh say he was afraid if they weren't truly a great number? So even from history and the Bible account, you see that they really were a big people. I read commentaries that are like, I'm, they were conservatives even, but like, I just can't really believe this. I'm like, just believe the Bible. Stop it. Um, but anyhow, I, I have struggle with sometimes commentators. Um, and uh, so here throughout the Bible, we see evidence for very large numbers of them being 603,000. And the first count, and by the second count after the first generation had died, 601,370 we'll see in Numbers 26. Well, I want us to look in verse 34. Here's a rich verse. Chapter 2, verse 34. Thus the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So they camped by their standards. So they broke camp, each one by his family, according to their father's house. As you see in chapter uh, 2, verse 34, they followed the word of the Lord. They stuck to it. And they're like, we are going to obey him absolute compliance here which is a huge contrast to just weeks earlier when they are at the foot of Mount Sinai and the golden calf maybe it's longer than weeks I'm not sure the period they camped out in Sinai some year or so that's why I said it's only about 38 years and about nine or ten months that this book covers it's because Exodus covers a year um, so a little over a year, just to give you kind of a feel for things. But those are a little of what I have today. By way of application, are you prioritizing God's word? When God says 150 times, and God spoke to Moses, does that, you should say, you know what, the Bible is self-authenticating, that it is God's message to man. 
thousands of times. I think it's some 3,000 times you have, thus says the Lord, God spoke, things of that nature. God meant for us to understand that this is his word, not the work of men. Okay, next, is his presence important in your life? You're like, I so long for God's presence. If you don't love his word, you don't really love his presence. You may want an emotion. You want to make a quick fix, but you're not interested in a real relationship. And so make sure that you're investing in the relationship. Seek to enjoy God's special presence through ministering in his church, where two or three are gathered in his name. We fellowship around the word. We sharpen one another. That's why it's important to be in ladies' Bible study and men's Bible study and Sunday school so that we can dig in. And we, I have been taught so many things by you. I have older men in the church, in the history of the church, I quote some who have passed away that sharpened me. And we get to pass on things that were shared to, our, to us in the faith 20, 30 years ago, 10 years ago. I'm like, man, this so helped. And so things like that, that we want to, to be building upon. Loving God's word, trying to apply it in all areas of life. Be careful of dismissing God's word through the world's reasonings and philosophies. The world will tell you it's all about you. You just need to think kind thoughts and it'll all work out. You just need to love yourself more. That's what the world sells to us and we wonder why it doesn't pan out. God's like, you have a love problem and it's too much of you and not enough of others, not enough of God. We have totally different worldviews. So if you don't approach life from the Bible's perspective, you're not gonna have the right perspective. You'll get in trouble. You will wander. And it might be 38 years, nine months in a wilderness that you don't wanna be in. Do you know what I mean? And have you ever gotten lost? Man, 38 years is a long time to be lost wandering with your GPS off. Make sure you're tuned in that the Bible is your GPS, okay? You need it. Next, which generation of Israel are you like? Are you like the complaining people that allows your fear, rebellion, unbelief, and despair to overtake the trustworthiness of God? You've got to take every thought captive. When you are feeling anxious, I need to believe God is more trustworthy. For those of you who weren't here for the concert, forever be sure, the one young gal, she shared in her 20s, she lost her husband in a car accident. And I was talking with, and she shared her testimony with you in the concert. She also shared with me, and she's like, what made the difference was Jerry Bridges' book, Trusting God. That's what I, I needed to be trusting to him. I needed to be anchored into him because she's like, I cried every day. I was just easily, I was just at a loss. But that book changed my life. Why? Because I needed to be oriented toward really trusting God. And that Psalm 27 is really that true, that I can always trust him. He's always my refuge. Well, you need to be careful of despair and those things. Or are you looking for ways to obey God by clinging to the truth of him being always faithful? We like the the saying Semper Fi for the Marines. But the Christian says, my God is Semper Fi. He is always faithful. May we be wrapped around our God. May he be our banner. May he be our warrior. May he be the one we follow. And that we would not be wrapped up in thinking these things don't matter. Don't check out on God. This is not a spectator sport. Let's pray. Father, would you please help us to be ones who are ready to do the work? Lord, we all need to be recharged at times. We all need to be good stewards of our body. We all need to be good stewards of our home. But it's going to happen through order, not random time plus chance. God, if we live by the seat of our pants... We're, not, we're going nowhere fast in the wanderings of this world. God, some of us need to get a calendar out and need to start making lists of work that we need to do so that we stop living aimlessly. Some of us need to pencil in 
appointments with you because if you're not penciled in, you are erased out at the end of the day. God, would you please help us to live orderly, to love you and honor you for you are worthy, our God. We desire you, we long for you, and we ask for your help for we're weak and we, we can easily become scatterbrained at a loss and in a disarray. We commit these things to you in Jesus' name and we worship you, Father, as Semper Fi, always faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.